you have to understand that you need people. You need people. I believe it was, you guys know Anthony Robbins? Most of you know Anthony Robbins. Some of you hate him. Some of you like him. Probably the most popular motivational speaker of our time. Anthony Robbins. Some of you know him as Tony Robbins. What he does is he makes associations between things. So he says that you are afraid of, of heights because you associate that with falling. You're afraid of snakes because you associate that with being bitten. You're afraid of marriage because you associate ball and chain. Do you see where I'm going? And what he does is, is he makes new associations. So he says, okay, you're afraid of heights. I'm going to have you jump out of a plane and you're going to see how much fun this is and you're no longer going to fear it. I'm going to take a snake and I'm going to wrap it around your neck and you're going to enjoy it and see that it didn't bite you. You're going to have a new association. I'm not really sure what he does with people from marriage. I'm not really, I'm not really sure where he goes with that. But he did this event once and he said during this event, he said, find something interesting about every single person that you run into. And this really happened. And someone from his crowd, they raised their hand and they said, well, what if there's nothing interesting about them? And he spat it back and he said, then focus on how amazingly boring these people are. <laughs> okay, we find something, something amazing about every single person. You know, I have this thing I talk about a lot that in today's world, we are in an age where perception is reality. Is that not true? Yes. Perception is reality. I mean, if you look at it, look at what's going on right now, political campaigns, right? And what does one side try to do to the other one? Yeah. Kill them, okay. <laughs> First time I've heard that answer, but we'll, we'll, we'll go with that. Don't anybody run against Millie in a, in a political campaign because you know your fate, okay? But generally speaking, you try, to, you try to paint them in a certain way, right? You try to create a perception. This person sleeps around all the time. This person's not good with finances. This person's not really a conservative. This person's not really liberal. You try to paint this because perception is reality. This couldn't be more true. About a year ago, and it might have been five years, I'm so terrible at that, but I think it was about a year ago, I'm in an event in uh, Chicago, and I go to, you know, usually I try to walk around, see what's going on, and I, I, when I'm done, I happen to be, I, I go to get in an elevator. And I'm going up to uh, the top floor, so I get in there, and I get on the elevator, and I start to go up, and all of a sudden, ding, 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 somebody jumps on the elevator, right? Guys, what are the unwritten rules when somebody gets on an elevator? Look you look down, that's right. I have a friend who actually turns around and faces them the whole time. So, <laughs> yeah, it's really awkward. <laughs> so... So the unwritten rules are, right, you give a little nod, right? You don't really say much, and if it gets awkward, you look at your phone. Do you guys know these rules? For any men in the house, how many men do we have in the house? <laughs> these are softball questions right now, guys, all right? See, I'm, see, I'm, I'm, I'm laying them in easy. So for any men in the house, it's kind of like when you're, when you're at a urinal and you know that you're not supposed to talk to the guy next to you. <laughs> I bring this up because some of you don't know these rules, right? I was in a place a couple months ago, and somebody, he's, he's I'm not going to say what he's doing, but he's doing his thing. You guys know what he, do, what he does, right? And he's doing his thing, and all of a sudden he goes, oh my God, you're the speaker, and I'm going... We're doing this right now, huh? This is, this, is, this is where this is happening, all right? That's an unwritten rule, you don't do that. Just like when you get on an elevator, you don't talk to people, you don't do this, right? It just doesn't happen. So we get on this elevator and we start to go up, and I start to smell something like I've never smelt in my life before. And I am tempted at this point to break all the unwritten rules and say, buddy, really? You know, I, I start to sniff, I start to sniff, and what does he start to do? He starts to sniff. And I'm thinking, buddy, there's only two of us on this elevator right now, okay? I mean, believe me, guys, I grew, up in, uh, I grew up in Washington State. I grew up in farm country where, you know, people hunted. We dragged around dead animals. We cleaned up manure. I mean, we, we, practi we practically played in manure. What I experienced on this elevator does not even, does not even compare, okay? I mean, it was, it was just, it was amazing, okay? This guy had a gift. <laughs> so here we are. We're on this elevator, and, and I'm really tempted at this point to break the rules. But do I break the rules? No, I don't. So we go up a couple more floors, and he gets off the elevator. He leaves a legacy, but he gets off the elevator, thank God. I had a decision to make. Do I stay on the elevator, or do I get off the elevator? I'm not walking to the top. Yeah, I can hold my breath for 30 seconds. I'm in shape, right? So I, I make the worst decision of my life, and I stay on the elevator. Now what am I thinking? Good God, do not let this elevator stop again, right? So we start to go up a little bit further, and lo and behold, ding, 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 elevator stops. And just my luck, it couldn't be like an old lady with like a wheelchair and a breathing machine. Oh, no. Three very young, attractive females get on that elevator. And at this point, I'm looking for anything. Just, just you know, I'm like a prison inmate looking for something to cut myself, jump off, do whatever I have to do, right? Just let this be over, right? So they get on there, and I'm thinking, well, maybe they won't notice. Maybe they have no idea. Maybe the smell is gone. It's just stuck to my upper lip, but maybe it's gone, right? That didn't happen. Because give it a couple floors, what did they start to do? What did I start to do? I figured reasonable doubt, guys. There's three of them, there's one of me. I'm going to sniff this thing out and act like it's one of them. I'm going to pin it on one of them. 
They go up a couple floors, they go to get off the elevator, and I think I've been successful, right? And they get off the elevator, now they've, you know, crossed the boundaries of unwritten rules are gone, and I hear one of them say to the other two, can you believe that guy? <laughs> Referring to me, okay? Now, guys, was I that guy? No. Real convincing story, guys. Seven of you said no, okay? <laughs> was I that guy? No. Thank you, okay? I need that for own personal benefit here. I was not that guy, but who was I to them? I was that guy, right? Think of it this way. I give you that story for a specific reason. I said that we live in a world where, where uh, you know, perception becomes reality. We live in a world where first impressions mean everything. Do they not? Yeah. First impressions mean everything. I mean, think of it this way. You can literally meet somebody who is the nicest person in the world on a regular basis, right? And you meet them or whatever, and they just happen to be on a, having a bad day. You meet that person, they're having a bad day, you're not going to label them. The next day you meet them, they're back to normal, they're back to being happy, whatever, and what are you going to say? Looks like the witch is having a good day, right? That's what you're going to think, first impressions. Unlike you can meet someone who's a terrible person, just absolutely terrible, but you meet them on the first time and they're in a great mood, whatever. Next day they have a bad day, you go, hey, just give them a break. You know, they, they need a little bit of a break, all right? This is what happens, because first impressions do everything for us. Think of it this way. If you, how many of you have children? Wow. I guess one thing we can do is breed, huh? <laughs> That's never been said from here, has it? This, this is going to get edited. Sorry, Joyce. So, how many of you have children again? Show me. Okay, how many of you have uh, a dog, something? How many of you have somebody you care about? I'm going to get all your hands here. Okay, so, the reason why I asked this question, if you meeting someone, if the first time you met someone, if literally your livelihood, if them eating the next week depended on them liking you or not liking you, would you greet people differently? Ask yourself that question. See, I'm all about, like, we always know these principles, but how intentional are we about these principles? If your family eating, if you eating, if you living, striving, you know, whatever it may be, if it literally depended on each person, them liking you or not liking you based on that interaction, would you greet people differently? And yet what I'm telling you is that you have complete control over how that goes. See, watch this. Everybody in there, I want you to, I want you to stand up and greet somebody less attractive than you. <laughs> first time, guys. First time that's ever been done. You really are going to do this while I'm talking, aren't you? See, he knows. He knows that he's a pastor here and I have to keep it easy. And there's all these things running through my head that I want to say right now. But it just wouldn't be respectful. So what he's really doing is taking advantage of the situation. I just want to point that out, okay? It's like Bishop all over again, right? So Anyway, the point is, you know, I said that, you know, haha, ha, whatever. But let me ask you this. You just laughed when you said that. If I told you at that moment to greet the person next to you, would it have been easier, more difficult? What would it have been? Why? See, here's the thing, guys. We have the ability to literally control physiologically what happens with us. Do you know what actually controls? Like, a lot of times you meet people, right? The interaction you have, I said that you have to understand that you actually need people. And this is tough for a lot of people to say. You get people especially, like I was raised by a single mother who it's that whole mentality, right? I don't need anybody. I just have, right? I don't care what anybody says. I don't care. Usually people who say, I don't care what anybody says, care more than anybody. It's a, th it's a defense mechanism, okay? And so what I'm doing right now is not to call you out, but more so so we can learn from these things, so we can grow from these things, right? And so... My point was this, though. You get these people, and, and you've got these interactions going on, and you, you, know, you change your physiology. You can actually have a control over what you do. You can have control over your physiology and those things. Do your emotions have anything to do with your interactions with people? Yes. You, you've said before, that person's crazy. Why did you come up with that reason? What, what made you think that? Emotions have so much. Do you know what actually controls your emotions? You guys have read a lot of books on this, I can see. It's like crickets in the background. <laughs> Do you realize your emotions actually dictate your emotions? I'm not going to do it right now, but if I wanted to, I'd tell every one of you to stand up and scream at the top of your lungs right now. You'd sit down and feel like an idiot, but guess what? You would feel better at that moment. You see, this is what great people have understood. This is what great people have learned. They have learned this. You look at, for example, right now we have President Obama in, and this isn't a political thing. I don't care, hate him, like him, whatever. This has nothing to do with that. But we, do you, why do you think they have people, PR people, whatever, that make hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars that teach them how to talk? Teach them voice reflection. Have you ever heard that President Obama is charismatic? Anybody ever heard that? What the heck is charisma? Can somebody tell me? Is it like a skunk? He comes in and just charismatizes the room? What, <laughs> what is charisma, really, when you get down to it? What is it? Here's the thing. Can everybody see me here? If not, I can't, I can't see you saying no. 
So if you guys can see me right now, what is the difference right now between this right here and this? What's the difference? It was about a quarter of an inch. What did it say to you? Confidence, lack of confidence. More importantly, what did it do to you? If I got up and I said, because I got up here and I said, guys, you know what? We're going to have a good time tonight. We're going to, you know, all this kind of stuff. If instead of doing that, I said the exact same words I said to you, but I went, hey, guys, we're going to have a good time tonight. Are you ready? What would be your response? What would be your response? Seriously. You would fake a phone call and leave the room, right? You'd, it's just like that, right? It's good to see you, man, right? You would do that exact thing. Why? Communication is 7% verbal, 93% a whole lot of other things. You know, I'm known, I'm known on the road as like the, uh, the why guy. That's what I am, right? Like the modern day, like you have the Anthony Robbins guy, whatever. They're all about the why. Why do things happen? How do things happen? Because everything makes sense. We all do things for specific reasons. You know, I get my friends, I get around them, and they'll say, you know, we're going out to have fun. Don't analyze me. You know, whatever. Because all of our stuff says something. You don't need to get verbal for you to tell me something. It's 93% of everything else. When I look at you and you're listening to me, you're telling me something right now. Where your head is, where your hands are, how you sit, what look you have, how closed your eyes are, how open your eyes are. All of these things say something about where you are. But how many of us understand those principles? Because I'm telling you that you will do better with more people around you. You know, there's this misconception out there that successful people are, a, are able to get so much more done in a shorter amount of time. Has anybody ever heard that? Somebody tell me. They're able to get so much more done in a shorter amount of time. And in that case, it may be true. Maybe they can get 10 things done in nine minutes instead of nine things done in nine minutes. That's great. But that doesn't, ca that doesn't catapult you to greatness, right? What, what successful people have learned and what the truth is about successful people, it's not that they get so much more done on their own. It's that they have so many more people working on their behalf. That's really what it comes down to. You know, when you look at it, like, uh, uh, you know, events and stuff that I book now, when I was just in the back right now, I just got a, a Facebook message over. This is good news, huh? A Facebook message over, and they said, we want you to come speak at our event, whatever, because so-and-so told us that you were amazing, and that, you know, whatever, and this one said, whatever, more people working on your behalf. Is generally speaking, the person who wins the presidency of the United States, are they the highest IQ, brightest person in the whole United States of America? Okay, you guys took a long time to answer that. That's great. So what is it then? What are they generally good at? Networking, grassroots, they have more people working on their behalf. Does that make sense? Okay, so right off the bat, we need to stop this mentality of, I don't need anybody, I don't need this, I don't need, we need people. And the better you are at these skills, and believe me guys, I could do three hours on this one topic right here. I have so many things I wanna say that I'm not gonna say right now for the sake of time. And so we need people. And the more we recognize that, the more intentional we are about the skills that it takes to get people to like us, the more better we're going to do. That's great English, right? The more better we're going to do, right? Let me, have anybody ever asked this question, right? You have somebody close to you, whatever. How many of you have ever asked the question to somebody close to you? If you could change one thing about me, what would you change? That is a tough question to ask. If you could change one thing about me, what would you change? How many of you have ever asked that question? Don't, don't raise it too quick. Now, here's what happens with that question. And by the way, you better go to someone you trust. And for any of you that are married, if you can't figure something out, just go get into a fight with your spouse. They will tell you everything you need to change, all right? <laughs> Ask me how I know that one, okay? So we know that this is true, but here's what's funny. Some of the answers that are going to come about aren't even true about you, and yet they are the perception. Right. Let me give you a perfect example. I am somebody that, you know, I do this for a living, but the truth is I'm an extremely introverted guy. And I went and married an Italian woman, right? We get together three times a week, family, and the other two, we're getting together with friends, and the other one, we're planning what else we're going to do, right? So I'm this extremely introverted guy where I would literally live in a cave. I mean, my father's here tonight. You live in a 4,000 square foot cabin on 11 acres on a lake by yourself, right? Yeah, 16, <laughs> yeah, you know? So, I mean, that's right, you bought, right? But you see my point, though, those kinds of personalities, extremely introverted, but you know what happens with those kind of personalities when you're not intentional about what you do? I go to events, and a lot of times I'll go to events, and part of the contract is you have to come to the pre-event or come to the post-event, come meet the people, come say hello, come do whatever it is, right? And I would literally go to these events, and I would hate it. The whole time, I'd be going, how long am I going to stay? We're going to have the same old conversation. What are you up to? What are you up to? What's the number one key to my success? What's the, oh, okay, never heard that question before. And you, know, you go through these whole kinds of things. And what I used to do is literally, I don't have my phone on me, I'd go stand in the corner, act like I was on the phone for 25 minutes, make sure the organizer saw that I was there, and then say goodnight, everybody. Now, it wasn't because I disliked people, it was because of this introverted nature. But you know what came from that? Do you know how that appeared to other people? Arrogant. What, are you too good for us? 
What do you, it had nothing to do with that. I actually enjoy interacting, but it was just that, that nature that pulled me aside. And they said, wow, what is he, too good for us? What is he, does that hurt or help my business? Okay, so that's a perfect example. Things that may or may not actually even be true about you, but we have to ask the questions. Does that make sense? Okay, second point, if you're taking notes. Very simple points, guys. Be careful who you hang around. All right, I guess I'll move on. You guys get it already. So, <laughs> be careful who you hang around. How many of you have ever heard the saying, what doesn't kill you will make you stronger? How many of you understand that's complete nonsense? How many of you have ever been through a situation that did not kill you, but you went, man, that situation stunk, and I'm putting it nicely right now. That situation did absolutely nothing for me, but I went through it. Anybody ever had that situation? Okay. So many of you are thinking of relationships right now. You're thinking of these kind of things. How many of you have ever been in a relationship that didn't kill you? It almost did, but it did not make you stronger. Anybody? There is a thing called mistakes. You know, we try to fluff everything like, you know, oh, you know, it's going to make it better. And, you know, God turns everything to the good. And we use it. There are flat out mistakes that don't make you stronger, right? But you have to be careful who you're around because I was talking recently to a couple. Don't worry, they're not here. So I'm not, you know, I think they're from Alabama. And now I'm hoping they won't see this video. So, not Alabama. I'm using that as they're, they're from somewhere down there. So, anyway, they're from Alabama. <laughs> it's the truth. So anyway, so I have got this couple I'm talking to, boyfriend, girlfriend situation, and they're telling me how the girl is going to get her master's degree, and the boyfriend doesn't want her to, and she can't, why doesn't he want me to get my master's? What is going on here? What is the deal? They're trying to figure this out, and I knew what was going on, but since I knew both of them, I also couldn't say it, but you know what was really going on? The boyfriend didn't want the girlfriend to get her master's, because then she was going to be too good for him, and, and she, he thought she was going to leave him, and guess what? He, she, he was right. <laughs> She, you know, she should leave him, right? And so a lot of times we have people like that in our camp who don't want us to go any further, don't want us to do any better, don't want us to whatever it may be because they want us to stay right where they're at because it's comfortable. Can anybody relate to that? Yes. All right. And so we have to be aware of this. You'll notice that my camp, so to say, is very small. I kicked John out about four months ago, right? I mean, it was just <laughs> enough already. No. <laughs> Just kidding. John's actually, John was like my mentor growing up. He's like a good, so when I mess with him, it just shows love, okay? So anyway, but the point is, is that I keep it small for a reason, because I'm very careful. There's one thing between interaction. There's another thing who are about people who are feeding you. What are they feeding you? Now, look, guys, don't get all spiritual on me either. We're always thinking, well, are they lifting me up at night? Are they? We need those kinds of people. But you know what I also need? I need someone on the weekend that I can just go hang out with and be myself and release. We need these kinds of people. We need people who lift us up in prayer, no doubt about it. We need people who give good advice, but we also need people who cover us and allow us to be ourselves. We need these kinds of people. It always cracks me up when I talk to people, and they're always so afraid to do this because this one's going to think that, and they're afraid of this because that one's going to think that. And I always think, why are you hanging around them? You can't do anything. If you're making your decisions based on what that one person who always has something to say about anything anyway, if you're making your decisions based on that person, you're probably not making wise decisions. Now, guys, I'll get friendly in a second, I promise you, okay? I'm actually, I'll put a smile on my face, okay? But do you hear what I'm saying? We've got to be intentional about these things. If you're taking notes, let's go to number three. This is a good one, guys. Pay attention to this one. We have to master the emotional content ratio. Didn't that sound smart? Yeah. I just lost like half of you. We have to master the emotional content ratio. I'm letting you write it down. Here's what the emotional content ratio says. They did a study and they wanted to know what was the difference between the emotional ratio of positive to negative thoughts between very normal people and very high successful people. And they wanted to know how many thoughts per day do they think, positive to negative, positive to negative. Very, what do you think the average normal person, thoughts that went through their head, what do you think the ratio was of positive to negative thoughts in their head? For the normal person, somebody yell it out. 80 to 20? Four to one? 50-50? Anybody else? 70-30? You guys getting I love how people are looking up like I'm going to get this right. None of you saw the study. <laughs> it's two to one. The average person thinks positive to negative two to one from a positive to negative uh, thought ratio every single day. Now, they wanted to know from people who are extremely highly successful how much that ratio changes. What do you think it changes to? Five to one? Anybody else? Ten, Ten to one? It's three to one. It literally only goes up by one, from very normal people to very highly successful people. Now, why do I tell you this? Here's what I found amazing. A lot of people look at that study and they say to themselves, 
Wow, look at that. The positive went up by one. Do you know what I tend to focus on with that study? The negative is still there. Went from two to one to three to one. It means that we still need negative in our lives in order to move forward. Go try and start a, a car battery with just a positive pole or a negative pole. You need both. Right? We come from two different extremes many times where many people will say they're just the Mr. Positive or the Mrs. Positive. You guys know these people? They drive you insane, right? Everything is great. Everything is whatever. And then you've got the other people that make you want to jump off of a, a cliff, right? <laughs> How you doing today? Well, I'm glad you asked. Woof. <laughs> Here goes nothing, right? You want nothing to do with those people. But it's the positive to negative ratio. But the truth is we need both of them. You see, I'm one that says when it comes to different situations and whatever, we need storms. There's no doubt we need positive. Focus on it, three to one or more. But we need storms. What do storms do? See, I'm a person that says, don't only prepare for the rain. I'd do a freaking rain dance. Is that allowed? Freaking? I've said it twice now, so I mean, freaking, freaking. So I'm some, I do a freaking rain dance, right? Because we need those things. What do storms do for you? What do negative things do for you? I mean, think about it. You go through like a Katrina-like situation, and what happens? You're grabbing on for dear life, just trying to whatever, and everything's getting washed away. Things you found out you didn't even need. Sometimes we go through things in relationships we don't need, people we don't need, whatever it may be, get washed away because we needed those storms. Just made some people very uncomfortable. All right, so we know that these are, you know, it's not just the positive, not just the whatever. We need both of these things, and they are both absolutely necessary. You see, what I like to, say, what I like to tell people is that a life full of nothing but rain and storms will leave you what? Mold and dampy. But at the same time, a life full of sunshine will lead you to a desert. Right? I'll say that again for you guys. A life full of sunshine will lead you to a desert. What does the Bible say? Consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds because the testing of your face will develop perseverance, right? Perseverance will become uh, whole and mature and will, it will finish. What does it say? Uh, what's the last part there? Persevere? Mature. mature. So I said it basically. I just thought there was more too, but I guess not. We need turbulence. We need these kinds of things. And so, please, do not react on either one, either extremes. They are both necessary. Does that make sense to you guys? You guys are intense now. Are we ready for the next one? Who's taking notes, by the way? I just want to see. I want to know who my friends are, the rest of you. <laughs> just wanted to know. Okay, here's a good one. Let go of fear in your life. You guys have heard these things before, but again, how intentional are we? Let go of fear in your life. Too many people, we've heard it before from this pulpit even, right? You cannot have fear and faith living in the same place, no more than light and darkness, right? You flip a switch, there's no, there's no debate that happens. Light turns on, right? You cannot have fear and faith. What we need to do is start having a little bit more faith in our abilities and stop letting fear dictate our decisions. Have a little more faith in your abilities and stop letting fear rule the day for you. Dictate your decisions. You know, I was reading a book recently, and I loved what it said. There was a gentleman named Ron Wayne. Anybody read the, uh, the book on Steve Jobs? Must be a bestseller already. <laughs> Nobody's read the book on Steve Jobs? Well, then I didn't get this from this book. I was in deep meditation, and I came up with this. <laughs> but, so anyway, so anyway, there's this guy early on. His name was Ron Wayne. And Ron Wayne, early on, back in 1978, was an early investor in Apple. You guys have heard of Apple? You have an iPod, iPad. Okay. So he was an early investor there, and he invested literally $2,300 in Apple back in 1978 for a 10% share in Apple. Some of you are going, are you kidding me? He did a $1,500 installment, and one month later he did an $800 installment. $2,300 for a 10% share in Apple. Seven to ten days after he made that investment, after he signed the contracts, he went back and annulled the whole thing. He was scared to death. What if I lose my money? That $2,300 today is worth almost two and a half billion dollars. Whew. Let that, let that soak in a little bit, right? That hurts me as I'm thinking. I would have given them more than $2,300 if I was alive, I guess, right? It was, wasn't alive yet, right? So fear, what happened in that situation? Fear. You know, we all say the nice words, right? Fear and faith, fear and faith. But how many of us are acting in fear all the time, afraid to take action, afraid, what's the government going to do? I saw a thing recently that many of the corporations that are, that are out right now actually have hundreds of millions and billions of dollars sitting in banks that they could use, but they're scared to death what the Senate is going to do. They're scared to death what Congress is going to do, so they don't want to invest it. Here's a little pointer for you. If your success or failure is determined by what the Senate passed, what the president does, or what someone on the external does, you might as well get in a coffin and wait. 
right? If your success or your failure is ultimately determined by what someone else is going to do, you might as well get into a coffin and wait. Does that make sense? You guys are real intense right now. I said to Pastor Mike beforehand, because a lot of you have ideas, you have things you want to do, and, and here's something for you to remember. If it's worth doing, it's worth doing badly. If it's worth doing, it's worth doing badly. Now you guys, you're going, what the heck does that mean? People who are perfectionists, people like myself, people like past, other people, one of the reasons why sometimes things don't get done with us is because things have to be absolutely perfect before we act on them. Now, did Apple wait until your iPhone was absolutely perfect before they released it to the market? Some of you, come on. Who were the guinea pigs? You were the guinea pigs, right? And yet, where is it now? I said to some people recently, I told you I'm, I'm writing a book right now called Don't Be a Wantrepreneur. A wantrepreneur is somebody who wants the results of a successful entrepreneur but doesn't have the guts to do it. That's what a wantrepreneur is. And I said to someone recently because they were trying to do all these different things to make everything perfect, they would never release, it's got to be the greatest thing that's ever hit the market, it's got to be whatever, it's got to... I said, just release it simply. Release it simply, you can add on things later. Do you realize Apple still has so many features they can put on their phones and everything, but they're holding off. It doesn't have to be perfect. This applies to so many areas of our lives. We sit back and wait for so many things to happen, for so many things, whatever, because it's not perfect at that moment. And yet, if it's worth doing, it's worth doing badly. Now, guys, I'm the excellence guy, believe me. I'm not taking away from excellence or anything like that, but what I'm also about is, is, is speed of implementation, action, how quickly you do things. Right? When I was here last time, I talked about the, the, the top 100 companies in the world, top 100 small businesses. Number one thing they had in common wasn't systems, wasn't management, wasn't customer service. It was speed of implementation. You hear something, you have an idea, you actually do it. That was the number one common denominator of the top 100 fastest growing companies in the world during a bad economy. Speed of implementation. When you sit back and do nothing, what are the odds of that thing having any success? <laughs> Somebody tell me, because I'm not good at math. Probably the first time I've ever said that in my life, right? I was like the math geek in high school. Rain Man, I think it was. <laughs> All right? So, if it's worth doing, it's worth doing badly. Let's move on to the next one here. And you guys will relate to this one. Make it a point to make someone else successful. You guys know Zig Ziglar? Yeah. Zig Ziglar said once, he said, if everything you want in life, if you want everything, then give, help someone else get everything they want in life. You can get everything you want in life if you help someone else get everything that they want in life. There's that law, right? We call it reaping and sowing. You guys have heard of the Dead Sea? I mean, our universe understands this principle. The Dead Sea, right, is the lowest form of water on the face of the earth. It, is, uh, it intakes from the, the Jordan River, the Galilean Mountains. And don't worry, guys, it's not going to be a quiz. Some of you just look down, okay? The Jordan River, the Galilean... So you think I'm just looking over the crowd. I'm looking at you, okay? The Jordan River, the Galilean Mountains. Where's it outlet to? Nowhere. It's a principle. Reaping what's sowing, right? I mean, it's the lowest form of water on the face of the earth. Highest mineral and salt content on the face of the earth. Nothing living can live there. You can have everything you want if you help someone else get what they want. This was something, you know, when I was, uh, you know, Pastor Mike mentioned earlier, when I, was in, uh, when I was in real estate, I used to go to, anybody a part of like a tip group, lead group, anything like that? Two of you? It's a great example. By the way, guys, uh, for any of you aspiring to be speakers, make sure you use examples that apply to about 0.08% of your audience. It's always a good idea, <laughs> but I've already committed. So we used to be a part of these tip groups, these lead groups, right? We go in there and everybody say, here's what's good for me. Here's what's good. And you all try to give each other leads, right? Okay. And so what was funny was the turnover in that group. That, that group was extremely successful for me, extremely successful. And yet the turnover rate was extremely high on this group because we'd hear from people, well, it's no good. No leads get passed, right? And for any of those groups, you have seen that, right? Nothing gets passed. It's not good for me. And you hear these kind of things. And what was funny is, when you go and watch them, what happened every week? Here's what's good for me this week. This is what I need this week. This is what's special for me this week. I don't have anything for anybody else, but here's what's good for me this week. I made it a point when I went into those groups, here's three leads for you. Here's five for you. Here's two for you. Here's whatever. It wasn't an accident that I got the most leads in that group, right? What's the common denominator in that situation? Yourself. There are laws that exist whether you recognize it or not. If you don't believe in gravity, I dare someone to step up on this chair and fall backwards, because Millie ain't catching you. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Just helping you out there, right? Gravity exists. There are other laws. Reaping and sowing, you can call it whatever you want. They exist on this earth whether you recognize them or not. They are still there. Ignorance of principles does not eliminate those principles. 
This is why so many people, I mean, even, even before I understood a lot of these principles, when I look back on my life, though, the things that I was doing, I'm going, wow, how does that add up? That's amazing, because I was in certain principles. I was functioning in certain principles. But how much more power when you start to recognize what those principles are? What's that movie where he dodges bullets and the Matrix? I knew it wouldn't take you long, right? You have the Matrix, right? And he starts to realize who he is. And he starts to recognize how the world works. And he starts to, anybody know what I'm talking about? They start to recognize those things. Wouldn't it be amazing? It's funny how much that movie actually, actually mirrored real life. Because I watch those movies, and it's funny. Like, I watch these things, and I'm, I feel like I'm thinking in a different way, and I'm just watching these, and I'm going, my God, if people understood how this world works. We're so mesmerized with other worlds because we can't figure out our own. Right? right? But if people understood how this world works, people are generally successful or not, not by accident. Right? I believe it was uh, uh, Donald Trump said, and I don't... I don't um, I don't aspire to be him from a, from a personal standpoint, but one of the things he said, which I loved, was that he said, one of the toughest things I ever did in my career was making my first billion. That's with a B, billion. He said, once I made my first billion, I never feared losing it because I knew how to do it. It's an amazing thought when you think about that. Once I made it, I never feared losing it because I knew how to, what does that tell you? There's a, there are laws of this world. There are ways things work. Where you are is not an accident. You have followed principles whether you recognize it or not. All of those things are there. Do you see what I'm saying? Let's move on then. Next up, who's taking notes again? <laughs> All right, more hands are going up. This is great. This is great. Next up, and this is actually going to be a huge focus on what I'm writing right now, which is to master the power of patterns. Such an easy concept, and yet so few understand this concept right here. Master the power of patterns. I believe it was uh, Jim Rohn. Anybody know Jim Rohn? Jim Rohn said, um, motivation gets you started, patterns keep you going. Or motivation gets you started, habits keep you going. We're going to talk about the relationship between those two in a second here. Motivation gets you going, patterns keep you, uh, uh, keep you going. Get you started, patterns keep you going. Patterns. When you look at patterns, patterns are a lot like mathematics. 2 plus 2 will always be 4, 3 plus 2 will always be 5. They always will be that. Patterns are no different. Patterns will always give you the desired result based on those patterns. If I follow the pattern tonight to go home and take the way that I'm supposed to go, I am always going to get to my house. My problem is, is that at half the time I don't know how to get anywhere, right? I have this big thing, right? Like this kind of a side note. But I believe, I told you guys in the beginning, I'm kind of like the why guy. I've always had this gift to understand why. I believe, how many of you have ever played that, uh, like the Madden football game? Another great example for this crowd, okay? <laughs> I'm going to keep them coming, guys, all right? Pretty soon we'll be talking Star Wars. We'll get right down to monster trucks. I'll, I'll, I'll hit right home with you guys. So, but you look at that game, very simple concept, though. On that Madden football game, and again, how many people have you ever played that game? Because I do not believe four of you. Thank you, okay? Little closet addicts, right? I know you play that, <laughs> Okay. But on that game, you have this ability, because if, you, if any of you are married to a man, there are other options now. So for any of you that are married to a man, you actually, right, that I just said, that's what my wife was talking about, right? And so for any of you that are married to a man, you know that playing these games, the reason why they love them is because they feel like they're actually doing it, right? Look at this, I'm the leading receiver. I'm the, and you're like, it's a Sega Genesis. That's like 15 years ago, right? PlayStation 3, do they have PlayStation 5 yet? PlayStation 3, we good with that? Okay. So you're saying these kind of things. But here, they give you the ability to create the player. So you can create yourself. And they give you like a certain amount of points. Like you have 100 points to create your player, right? And so you can do like 60 towards agility, 20 towards speed, and you got like 20 left. Does this make sense to everybody? I feel like that's how God made me. I feel like he took me in the why things and all these other things, and then he was like, speed in the water and directionality, I got nothing left, kids, sorry, right? That's honestly what I think happened. And so, let's get back to patterns. Power of patterns, just like math, always equal. I said you, you follow the pattern to get home, you'll always get there, right? These are all patterns. We are right now, you've probably heard this before, we are a direct result of the patterns we follow. Just like ignorance of principles is no excuse, ignorance of patterns is no excuse either. It will always get us there. We are the direct result. Where we are five years from now will be a direct result. I used to apologize when I'd get up in front of, of crowds and I'd say to them, you know, oh my God, I don't know how this happened. I don't know how this happened at such a young age. I don't know how this happened. I don't know whatever. And I'd do this big apologetic thing. And finally, I was like, what are you doing? You know exactly what happened. You followed patterns. 
Have you ever seen that, uh, what's the guy, the funny guy, the c- uh, comedian show, it used to be on, he's got the glasses, um, now, now he hosts a show, uh, like Family Feud or something like that, what is it? Oh, Drew Carey, thank you. Great expression, I mean, thank God we're playing a board game, that was a terrible description of the guy. He wears glasses, that just narrows it down, right? <laughs> he's a white guy, he wears glasses, about 5'10 to 6'1". So, if you remember correctly, uh, he had a show on one time, and on that show he was talking to his friends, and they were amazing bowlers. Because in high school, when all the other kids were going to see, he was like, when you were at senior prom, bowling. When you were partying on Friday night, bowling. And now the guy was an amazing bowler. Patterns, right? And so I used to apologize for different things, but the truth is, everybody in here has the exact same opportunity. Patterns. What patterns have you created? You see, you can't take the ingredients for a pizza, shove it in the oven, and expect a lasagna. You can't take the ingredients, the patterns, for a mediocre life and expect expect extraordinary. Right? Just like you can't take the ingredients or patterns for an extraordinary life and expect mediocre. Does that make sense? Here's an equation I want you guys to follow. Patterns develop habits. Habits develop perseverance. Put those three things together, you will always get the results you deserve. It works in every single thing in your life. Patterns develop habits. After 21 days of patterns, it becomes a habit. Once you form a habit, you now develop perseverance. So if you start going to the gym 21 days, all of a sudden you're like, I don't feel like going, well, I still go, perseverance. You will ultimately always get the results you deserve based on that equation. Let's take a stupid example. How many of you bite your nails and will admit it openly? Wow, are you serious? What, did all the nail biters just get together in the middle row there? You have, like, Nail Biters Anonymous? You're not so anonymous anymore, are you? Because I just called you out, right? So, you guys in this group over here, you're actually out of place if you don't bite your nails over here. So, if you develop a pattern of biting your nails, after 21 days, what's going to happen? It's going to become a what? A habit. After it becomes a habit, you now develop perseverance. Perseverance means that even in socially unacceptable areas, you are still going to bite your nails. In socially unacceptable places, you are still going to bite your nails. And what's the ultimate result? Short nails, pain, bleeding nails, whatever it may be, because patterns don't lie. Does that make sense? Aristotle said, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence, therefore, is not an act, but a habit. It's an amazing quote when you think about it. Let's get into generational poverty. We're going to touch all areas. You know, I came from single mother, you know, the whole welfare, the, you know, two brothers that didn't graduate high school, you know, the whole thing, right? I came from that situation. I don't like to glorify that situation, but like to say, hey, I came from there, whatever, right? And yet somehow, graduated high school early, scholarship to college, all the things you hear afterwards. Why? Why? Why does it happen? But you look at generational poverty. They did a study on this as well, and they found that kids from lower-income housing or lower-income families tend to show, tend to show different patterns, different ways of doing things that do not lead to success. For example, very simple, when they go and visit the doctor, they don't feel the openness to ask the doctor questions. Sit there and do it, you know, whatever. There's no sense of entitlement. Kids from upper family, you know, know, upper price range, whatever you want to call it, affluent houses, they found that when they go to the doctor, they'll ask the doctor all day, what are you doing? Why are you doing that? There's a sense of entitlement. I don't want you to think of entitlement as a bad word. Entitlement's actually a good word, if it's used correctly. And so they have a sense of entitlement. They go through their whole life patterns that make them feel this way. You are entitled to succeed. You are entitled to do better. Whereas you take someone from a lower income house, this is not in every single situation, but on a percentage basis, they feel like, well, I'm just supposed to be nothing. I, I'm either going to be a rapper or nothing. I'm either going to be working the, the, for the union over here doing the, this or nothing. Or I'm going to work over And they have these kinds of patterns. And it adds up. You look at generational poverty. Why does it become generational? Why does it happen? Is it an accident? That's the real question. Is it an accident? It's not. Thank you for that answer. Appreciate that. Because these things add up. I said on the why guy, everything adds up for a reason. It's never a mistake. I love what Jerry Rice said. You guys know Jerry Rice? Probably the greatest wide receiver of all time. Some would argue greatest player of all time if he played a different position. But Jerry Rice said, and I love this, one of my favorite quotes. He said, today I will do what others won't, so tomorrow I can do what others can't. Today I will do what others won't, so tomorrow I will do what others can't. 
See, there's a problem with the follow the herd mentality. Where does the follow the herd mentality get you? Where the rest of the herd is going. So the question is, if we understand this, once we understand patterns, why do many of us not follow them? Why? I have this other theory. This is my theory. Everybody wants a bestseller. Nobody wants to write the book. Right? Everybody wants the bestseller. Nobody wants to write the book. I love it when I hear from people. I'll get Facebook friends and, you know, uh, all this stuff and friends from high school and, you know, people that, you know, sat next to you in school and whatever, and they'll say, my God, you're so lucky. Oh, you're so lucky. Oh, you're just so lucky. I love it when I hear that. You're just so lucky. And I just sometimes want to write back some not nice things. And I'm thinking, I'm lucky? Drew Carey, baby, while you were at the senior prom, right? And you start going through these kinds of things. When you were at that party, when you were in college doing whatever college kids do, which you have college kids that study a lot and work the books all night. When you were doing those kinds of things, what was I doing? Has nothing to do with luck. Patterns, these kinds of things. Let's move on to the next one, guys, because I literally talk patterns all night. Another good one. The difference between talent and skill. You want to have some kind of an impact out, outside of here. I said that people, your success speaks louder than your preaching. So let's talk about the difference between talent and skill. Anybody read the book Outliers? Good, great book, right? Talent and skill. Talent is something that you can have God given, just given to you. Whitney Houston's voice is a talent. Tiger Woods, for the most part, his natural whatever, has a natural talent for golf. Skill is something you develop. They did a thing once, they actually, in this book, they broke down the highest, the highest successful people on this earth and how they got there. And you know what they found? Common denominators. They found that of all of they took the Beatles. The Beatles, when they first started, stunk. Couldn't even play for an hour, they stunk. But they started playing strip clubs seven nights a week. They, they took people like Bill Gates, and they found that Bill Gates just happened to be born at a time in his life where he happened to be placed next to one of the only programming computers on the face of the earth that he could use all day and learn programming. And the reason why it matters when he was born is because he had nothing better to do. And they found that what these people had in common is that every single one of them, on the highest degree, I'm not talking all-stars, I'm talking Hall of Fame, what they, what they found was that they had put in more than 10,000 hours worth of practice. That's skill. How many of us have put in those kinds of hours? How many of us can say we deserve it? Do you realize that in the National Hockey League, over 70% of the players are born between January and March? What an accident. What a coincidence. Over 70% were born between January and March, but it had to do with back in the junior leagues, they picked the kids who were older, so it was by birth date, because they wanted the older kids, so because at that age, when you're four, five, six, seven, eight, whatever it may be, there generally is a difference between an eight-year-old and a seven-year-old. And so when they picked those kids born between January and March, they had three times as much ice time as every other kid. So it wasn't they were more naturally gifted, they got more ice time, 10,000 hours. How much time are you putting into your, your skill? I love it when people talk about predestination. That's where I'm really, just when I get really popular. Predestination, you're just going to be whatever God says you're going to be. It's just going to happen. And then, and then the old good thing, right, when we don't accomplish what we set out to, well, it just must not have been God's will. You guys heard this one? It drives me sick. I mean, it just drives me sick. Just must not have been God's will. Anytime something happens, hey, it was good. Anytime it didn't, it just must not have been God's will. Because predestination, we're going to go wherever we're supposed to go. It has nothing to do with us. It's just going to happen. I remember a scripture that says, after you've done everything you can do, then you stand. But I know a whole lot of people just standing, saying, hey, where is it? What's going on? I thought, thought it was supposed to work out. I thought God said 10,000 hours. God might have said, how much time have you actually put into that particular skill. Because if you're going to believe that predestination stuff, then you also have to believe that somebody who goes terrible, turns, turns into an alcoholic, becomes a mass murderer, and ends up in jail, it's really not their fault. Predestination. It's supposed to happen anyway. It wasn't their fault, right? So don't buy into that stuff. Take self-responsibility. You know, it's amazing. When you take this kind of approach, all of a sudden you start to understand the favor of God a little bit more. Because I used to have a real problem with the favor of God. I really did. I'd look at things and I'd be like, oh my God, this is just, you know, I can't take it, I can't whatever. And yet you start to look at it because when you start to put an allergy whatever, now you take into the whole obedience thing, the favor of God thing, and all that kind of stuff. And I realized that, you know, I worked at a job, for example. I worked at a, a moving company where I was in line to take over and all these things happened. And, you know, it was a good job. You know, free gas. I mean, the whole thing. It was really good. Paying the bills, doing really good. 
And I believe that God had called us out into real estate. I'm going, I don't want to go into real estate. I got a good job right now. Why would I go into real estate? So I went into real estate. Got him number one. Everything's going great, making lots of money. And he says, hey, I want to bring you out of that. I'm going, come on already. I'm doing good in real estate. I don't want to get out of real estate. I got to go hit the road. Come on, this is crazy. I don't like to travel. I like to talk to people. Now I got to stand up in front of people. What is this, right? And then all of a sudden, I believe it was about six months ago, I was having, I was having lunch with Bishop and I was like, oh my God, prophecy fulfilled. Back when I was 14 years old in this church, not in this church, it was at the other location, I was getting ready to sneak out the back to go help with the bagels and, and drinks for everybody. Really, I was just trying to get out of church. And all of a sudden, you know, Bishop, at that time, pastor, calls me up and prophesies. You're going to speak to masses. You're going to do all this kind of stuff. And it's amazing when you look at the path. But had I not put in that work, that whole skill thing, where would I be? Well, I guess it wasn't God's will. Right? How many of you have a, well, I guess it wasn't God's will? Because here's the thing, you're still here. Patterns, all of these things can get you to where you need to be. I don't say this to condemn, I say this as a, hey, you're still here. What do you, what are you able to do? You know, I had a problem with the real favor of God thing until you start to follow this obedience, you start to realize how things work because we had a situation where, for example, there's a guy, I won't name his name, he runs a huge organization, which I won't point out, huge. He was the number one best-selling author in China 2009, sold over a million copies of books, did all this kind of stuff. And recently he was asking me for advice. <coughs> He's asking me for advice. He's asking, how do I do this? How do I do that? And I remember thinking to myself, why in the world are you asking me? Favor of God. I almost got jacked up. God was like, he's not looking at you. Who's in you? You're not all that bright. Amen. But you did prepare. Amen. Right? Many times people don't see the hours behind the scenes. I always compare myself to like a duck above water, right? You'll see me. It's just kind of smooth. I'm going along. But what's going on underneath that water? I mean, it is crazy what's going on underneath that water, Right? <laughs> That's the true sign of an entrepreneur, right? They live that kind of a lifestyle. Hey, going here, going there. But under the water, man, they are flapping those things, right? All right, let's move on here. When you look at it, too, it's funny. You look at someone like Beyonce Knowles. Didn't expect to hear about her, did you? <laughs> Beyonce Knowles. What I do respect about Beyonce Knowles is that she's on the side. I relate to her so much because on the side, when she's by herself, she's just this little gentle whatever, just very calm, very whatever. And yet you see her on the stage, and you're like, bootylicious. Like, that's, that's, that's what she does, right? I mean, that's, that's what she does. And so you see this, and you're like, what the heck? It just doesn't make sense. What is she, whatever? But she says that before every single act, every single performance, she says to herself in the mirror, I deserve this. I have put in the work. I deserve this. How many of you have that kind of mentality? Let's move on. I'm going to cover something really quickly here. You know, there's different scriptures that talk about pressing towards the mark and these kind of things. Do you understand what your mark is? Do you understand, especially we're going to New Year's, how many of you are going to set a new goal at the beginning of this new year? How many of you are going, how many of you are raising your hand just so you don't feel bad that I'm saying it, you're not raising your hand, right? I mean, come on, let's be honest, right? Some of you are so sick of not hitting your goals, you're not going to hit them anymore, right? You're not, gonna, you're not even going to set them anymore. Anybody know what I'm talking about? <laughs> right? You're like, I'm done with that. Why well, set myself up for failure? It's not going to happen. Here's why over 90 plus percent of people don't hit their goals. There's a couple reasons, and I'm going to cover them very quickly for you. Number one, most people don't understand the why of their goals. I talk to people all the time at conferences. I'm like, what do you want to do next year? I want to make $250,000. I'll say, no, you don't. They'll say, yeah, I kind of do. I'm like, no, you don't. They're like, yeah, really do. And I go, why? You want a bunch of paper with dead people on them? It's not about the money. Every goal you have, every whatever it is, is ultimately about the, the feeling that it's going to give you. You want $250,000 because it's going to give you a feeling of security, a feeling of respect among your peers. What feeling are you after? Don't tell me what money amount you want. We can set that after. What are you ultimately after? If you don't know, you'll never hit it. What feeling are you after? Here's another mistake people make. I'm the big positive guy, positive environment, the whole thing, and yet when people are setting goals, one of the biggest mistakes they make is that they always, they always set their goals about the positive. What's going to happen? Well, if I do this, my kids will be doing well, and if I do this, what you need to do when you're setting your goals is actually go out there and set the negative consequences for not hitting that goal. Negative consequences. You know, for example, I was raised by a single mother, right? And if I don't hit this goal, you have to be real with yourself. What are the true negative consequences? I can't buy the things for my kids that other kids have, and they're going to feel less than. I can't pay my rent, and we're going to be homeless. Those are real negative consequences. But, but catch this. How many of you know that music has the power to bring you back to when it originally came out? I almost just sang a song. Very high pitched. I think it was a Bee Gees or something, right? So I just mentioned it and someone moved their head, okay? You see what I'm talking about. Music has the ability to bring you back, yes or no? Yes. You will literally, I was sitting in a, in a sports bar in Pittsburgh a couple months ago because my TV went out in the hotel room, but I got to watch my Yankees, and I probably shouldn't have. 
And so I go down there, and all of a sudden, Poison comes on. I'm not talking about Poison, the 80s rock band. I'm talking Poison. P -p 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 <laughs> poison, right? The whole Belby Devote. You, you guys know where I'm going, right? So the song comes on. I can't even help myself. I'm moving. I don't even realize I'm doing it because it has the power to bring you back. That same psychological, that same emotional response you have, I'm telling you, negative consequences have the ability to bring you back to original motivation. Every one of you set goals because at that moment you have an original motivation. You're like, I'm going to do it. I feel motivated because we're going to do this, we're going to do that. And you feel motivation at that moment. What I'm telling you is that negative consequence has the ability to bring you back to original motivation. And so three months down the road when you don't feel like it, you go, kids aren't going to feel like they are as much as everyone else, we're going to be homeless. I'm motivated again. That's how it works. Physiologically, that's how it works. I said, I go, who was at the men's advance last year? Okay, so one of you asked me to come play basketball when I was walking by, and I hadn't played basketball in a long time. Earl, if you remember, I came over to play tennis, and I was half dead, right? And so I go over to play basketball. I'm like, I used to, I mean, guys, I played basketball, starting point guard. I was on the AU team, the whole deal, right? And so I'm like, I'll play a little basketball play about two games and I'm doing all right. I mean, I feel like, you know, no air balls, you know, whatever. But after about two games, I am literally ready to die. I am begging the guy I'm guarding to please stop running around, just shoot jump shots. That's basically what was going on. Just please, you know? There's no ref here, I'll hold you if I have to. You know, this is what's going on here, right? <laughs> to me, it was literally embarrassing. I'm like, are you kidding me? I'm in shape, I'm whatever, what is going on here? So I set a goal. I decided, I've got two little boys, right? And I decided that my little boys, when they are in high school, I, want, I don't want to be one of those guys who watches the games and like got the little gut there and it's like, hey, whatever, you know, but I want to still dominate my children. <laughs> and if you know me, I'm only half kidding, okay? I want to dominate my children and their friends, okay? I don't want to just whatever. I want to, so I set a goal. And I said, what is the negative consequence? Negative consequence is I'm not going to be able to do that. Now you say, that's well, no big deal. It was a big deal to me, okay? And so when all of a sudden I say, okay, I'm going to run every other day, I'm going to go to the gym every other day, I'm going to get in the best shape of my life, whatever. When we live in the Northeast, and it's time to go running after I put my kids down, and it's freezing cold, makes you want to throw up, and you're running around ice, guess what? I love the result more than I hate the pain it takes to get there. That's why most of your goals don't work. You set them based on what other people's perception is of you. You say, I want to lose weight. And the truth is, you're not that unhappy with yourself. You're unhappy with how other people perceive you. You get into situations, and you go... They're not looking at me the right way. I'm in a wedding party and I feel like someone looks better than me. I feel like whatever. And so that's why you go to the gym and you're like, I'm going to make this work now. I'm going to make them feel better about me. And then three weeks down the road when you're sitting down in your sweats, eating nachos, watching TV, and you're supposed to go to the gym, you're going, I didn't really want it that bad. <laughs> so you better figure out what your why is, not what someone else's perception of your why is, because you have to want the result more than you hate the pain it takes to get there. Does that make sense? Yes. Let's move on here, and I'm about to come to a close. I got two minutes. Find the paradigm shift in your life. Most people have a misconception about what a paradigm shift is. Let me tell you what a paradigm shift is. When a bug continually runs into a window and can't get through the window and figures out that it doesn't matter how many times he rams his head into that window, he is not getting through the window. The paradigm shift occurs when he recognizes an open window two feet to the right. That's a paradigm shift. My question to you is, what window are you continually running your head into? Because God said. What window are you continually bashing your head into when there is a window open two feet to the right if you just cut the stubbornness and say, there's an open window? Which one is it? You know, I honestly believe that everybody in this room has a calling. I also believe that it's our job not to screw it up. I believe in, you know, I've got friends, for example, I've got friends that are better looking than me, I've got friends that are more charismatic, I've got friends that are funnier, I've got all these kinds of friends, right? And sometimes we'll have discussions, they're like, why do you get to travel all over? Why do I have to go to an office job? Why, whatever? And we go through all these things, they're like, what's the reason, what's the reason? Here's one reason I can come up with. I was watching an interview with Will Smith once. I developed this thing called the treadmill principle. The treadmill principle is something everyone in here needs to adapt, or adopt. See how I corrected that? My wife was a second grade teacher, so I... I butcher the English language for many of you. Here's the treadmill principle. The treadmill principle says this. I'm a pretty competitive guy, right? If you and I, let's say you challenge me to some kind of treadmill off, if that's such a word. 
We get on there. You might have more endurance than me. You might have whatever it may be. You might be faster, whatever. But one of two things are going to happen if you challenge me on that treadmill. You're either going to get off the treadmill first, or I'm going to die on that treadmill. <laughs> You're going to get off the treadmill first, or I'm going to die on that treadmill. How many of us have that mentality? How many of us really do? You know, you come from a place, you live in America, where you can, you know, you, you guys can do so many things. It's easier than ever to start businesses. It's easier than ever to do these kinds of things. You, we do things all the time. We focus so many times on what we don't have instead of what we have. You know, I honestly believe a lot of times we'll say to people, well, how come you're not doing this? How come you're not doing that? And the number one reason people say is, I don't have the resources. They'll say, I don't have the resources. I didn't come from resources. It's not about your resources. It's about your resourcefulness. It's not about your resources. Somebody who's going to find a way is going to find a way no matter what. Your success speaks louder than your preaching, right? We come from a world where, do you know when the deadliest hour in America is? I'm going to close with this, guys. Great way to close, right? It's when everybody dies. <laughs> do you know what the deadliest hour in America is? The deadliest hour is when the most people die is Monday morning between 8 and 9 a.m., statistically. People would rather die than go to work on Monday morning. <laughs> It's funny when you think about it, it really is, because it's so true. My message to you is please don't be those people. I said your success speaks louder than your, you know, preaching. Call it whatever you want to call it. We walk around moping, saying we don't like, all of these kinds of things. Then we wonder, how come nobody follows me? How come nobody whatever, you know, how many, you know, whatever. Would you want to follow you? Ask that question, would you want to follow you? Your success speaks louder than your preaching. Focus on the things you have. Focus on the little things you can do. Because believe me, guys, we have a lot more opportunity than a lot of people out there. Your success speaks louder than your preaching. Thank you.